Welcome to Energy Follies 1, New Energy Investment, Animal Spirits Meet Irrational Exuberance. We'll talk today about uh, giving some serious consideration to investing in certain types of new energy technologies and especially electric vehicles. Um, the thing is that it is very easy to go wrong. Uh, the first thing you want to do is avoid screwing up. Uh, to use the technical business school term, uh, there are a lot of ways to go wrong. Uh, you can have bad luck. Uh, no one is immune from that. But you can also follow fashions or fads and do that instead of uh, due diligence. All too often you'll hear people say, oh, everyone's doing this or this is the hot thing now and we're investing because of that. There's also a problem with irrational exuberance where people become excited about a particular uh, technology or fuel uh, or even a company without thinking it through very carefully. Um, and finally, wishful thinking affects a lot of people. That is, believing something will work out the way they want, thinking that you can scale up, uh, for example, a technology from the laboratory to the real world. Have fads. Um, you would think that business people would not be uh, subject to fads, but I recall back in the 80s when power ties were the thing, and people wrote books about, for example, how if you wore a yellow tie, it showed that you were powerful because you know people just didn't wear yellow ties and on Wall Street. Um, similarly, people argued that you, if you had a big briefcase, it meant you were very busy and important. And then someone said, no, if you have a small briefcase, it meant you had people to take care of things for you. So let's face it, uh, the people in business, men and women, tend to fall prey to certain types of fashions that are not necessarily very rational. Um, we've also seen time when uh, things like technology was all the rage. Uh, in the 1960s, it was said that uh, if you sold swimming pools and you called your company swimming pool technology, uh, your stock price would be 20% higher than without the word technology. Uh, at one point, people thought conglomerates uh, were more likely to be successful than a single business uh, companies um, and so the result was that uh, there were lots of mergers and acquisitions uh, later uh, reversed when people realized that it was very difficult to handle a uh, big complex uh, companies uh, of course we know the dot-com bubble uh, and more recently the green bubble or clean tech uh, and the problem with fads is that they often substitute for serious research that is people don't uh, then think about, is this product likely to succeed? Is it desired by the market? Uh, what are the finances of the company, for example? Um, and it tends to take the place of thinking about price. Uh, you often see products touted without any discussion of the price. Uh, you see this certainly in electric vehicles where people talk about the wondrous uh, Tesla Model S or Mercedes, uh, very expensive vehicles. So the examples that we've seen of these kind of fads in the past, uh, electric vehicles, as I mentioned, uh, they've come and gone several times in the last 40 years, um, come one more time than gone, obviously, at present. Uh, Jatropha beans, uh, there was a lot of investment in Jatropha beans as a source of biodiesel, uh, which uh, apparently has not played out. Fuel cells, we'll come back to that. Uh, cold fusion uh, was a big thing, and some people put money into that, uh, despite the fact that people do not seem to have been able to demonstrate any uh, actual results. Uh, this is a classic case uh, of uh, how fads uh, can lead people astray. This is uh, the stock price of Ballard Power, which in the mid to late 90s said, we have a new uh, type of fuel cell. It's much cheaper. And people became convinced that this would uh, translate into fuel cell vehicles. 
um, several companies announced plans to not only invest huge amounts of money with Ballard Power, but uh, Mercedes, uh, sorry, Daimler Chrysler said, we are going to be selling 100,000 fuel cell vehicles a year by roughly 2005. Um, obviously, that did not happen. Um, and it was pretty obvious to a lot of people uh, at the time that this was not really uh, an imminent breakthrough, uh, that we did not have the technology anywhere close to where it needed to be to provide uh, an actual power plant for a vehicle. Uh, yet you can see the stock price for Ballard Power shot up uh, from roughly uh, $2 a share to over a hundred and back down. So when people tell you, for example, oh, look at the share price of Tesla Motors, uh, that's not necessarily uh, the best evidence you wanna have of its, uh, the company's potential. So irrational exuberance, uh, this I think is when people get excited about something and sort of overlook the evidence. Um, one is, you know, markets will do what we want, that is, uh, we have an expensive product, but don't worry, the price of competing products will go up. You saw this uh, in the case of Exxon and its uh, old colony shale product back, project back in the 1980s, uh, which was not economic, but the company, or at least senior management in the company, was convinced that the oil price, having just tripled, would continue going up and making the project uh, economical. Uh, you see this now when people talk about renewable uh, power uh, and they argue that, well, electricity prices will go up in the future. Uh, secondly, p customers will buy what we want them to buy. Uh, it's always amazing when people take a product that no one's buying and they try to blame the customers for that. Uh, if you watch the movie, uh, Who Killed the Electric Car? Uh, you'll see uh, there's, a, there's a lot of talk about how this was a wonderful product uh, and we just don't understand why people wouldn't buy it. Uh, and going in, of course, people will say, well, don't worry about uh, this problem or that problem. The battery is expensive. It doesn't work very well. It doesn't hold a charge. Uh, it doesn't have much range. Oh, don't worry. The customers don't care about that, even though in the past they always cared about that. Uh, third, governments will fix everything. Oh, the government uh, will put mandates uh, for renewable fuels or will provide subsidies for them, uh, and that will guarantee our business. Um, it can be helpful, but we've seen a lot of cases where, in fact, governments will step back, uh, not keep their promises, or, or not do what you expect them to do. Um, and especially, you, you run into the problem that uh, a lot of people promoting these new technologies or fuels will tell you, well, price doesn't matter, that people don't care as much about price because they want what I'm providing, which is uh, clean power, for example. This was a case with Enron's uh, big LNG project in India, uh, Dabhol, where uh, they were selling some of the most elect uh, expensive electricity on the planet not just needless to say in India, but they were convinced that, well, the Indians uh, would be willing to pay because it was clean and reliable. <sighs> Technical feasibility. Uh, people often will tell you, ah, this is possible. I can do this. A and that's true. Uh, here we have a car, a vehicle, I guess I should say, which is powered by Diet Coke and Mentos. Uh, you can do a lot of things that aren't worth doing. Um, the fact that something can be done either in the laboratory or at full scale doesn't mean it's feasible as a commercial product. And I suppose you can forgive many for taking optimistic views of their competitors' prices since uh, most oil price forecasters think that oil prices should be $100 or more. Uh, this is from a, the 2014 survey that the Department of Energy did, uh, and I cherry-picked this particular one because uh, it's just before the price crashed, and I was the only one saying prices would be low uh, over the long term, and that's still pretty much true. Um, but the point is that uh, for most of the last four decades, 
uh, the vast majority of price forecasters have thought oil prices would go up and would stay up. Uh, and so therefore, people like uh, biofuels uh, developers can perhaps be forgiven for thinking that um, they would have less competition from conventional petroleum. Uh, on the other hand, if the price is low and you think it will go up, then uh, I think that suggests a certain lack of due diligence. Uh, this is especially true when you think of the history of prices. Uh, here I've just shown the three uh, U.S. Department of Energy price forecasts. Historically, the department's low price forecast has been relatively close to the actual price, uh, but you can see that their reference case in green is far, far above the historical price. Uh, and I would say it's not very credible. It's not impossible. Uh, but frankly, people should look at that uh, very skeptically, especially if it impacts their business plan significantly. Uh, the flip side of exuberance is the uh, rationalization that are given when customers do not buy your product or you want the government to force people. Uh, there's any number of explanations for why renewable energy, electric vehicles, and so forth have not succeeded yet. Uh, who killed the electric car? They, they blamed uh, the lack of sexy models in the uh, automobile advertising that GM did. Uh, people often talk about discount rates and say that consumer discount rates are very high, so they won't invest in things like solar power because the return is relatively low. Uh, the volume or learning curve argument is, well, if, if the government made people buy a lot of them or subsidize the purchase, then eventually the cost would come down. In the private sector, you never hear this argument. If someone says, I can build a factory, uh, but it, we still won't have a cheap enough product, then you just don't build the factory. The, the product's not ready. Finally, externalities. Uh, this is a very popular argument because it's, it has some validity in theory, but the practical application is minimal. It is very hard to estimate most externalities. Uh, you will find a wide variety of, uh, of numerical estimates for different things like uh, the security cost for oil, uh, the uh, impact of coal power on health in a given region or globally, and so forth. Um, and you will note that externalities are not applied to anything, really. Uh, you could say that alcohol maybe uh, is a case, but it's really more, that's, that's more of a syntax. Uh, so, you know, when people say, oh, well, the externalities justify this, you have to say, well, why don't they justify anything else? <clears throat> so, why did electric vehicles not succeed in the past? Well, you know, a lot of the arguments really avoid the actual truth. They say things like, oh, the styling of the car was just, you know, too old fashioned and fuddy duddy, that Detroit is too conservative. They're not far thinking enough to be able to figure out how to make an electric car. Uh, advertising, as mentioned, uh, oh, the oil industry or there's right wing opposition. Uh, of course, uh, the Koch brothers, Koch brothers, excuse me, George W. Bush and so forth. It's all their fault. Uh, no one talks about the fact that the batteries are crappy um, and the cars don't work very well. Instead, you get just exuberance, near constant exuberance, especially in the media. There was an article uh, that CNN did, a story in 2007, and they said, you know, this, the next little thing, small electric vehicle companies that are going to take over from Detroit. These are the people who know what they're doing. Uh, they can make a revolution in the automobile industry, and Detroit had better beware. Uh, the funny thing is, the only one of these companies still extant is Tesla, which is not mentioned in this list because they said, well, Tesla is only going to make luxury cars. This is the Aptera. Seen one recently? Seen anything that looks like this recently? Would you pay a lot of extra money for a car that is small 
uh, doesn't have a good range, um, and doesn't seat many people. I, I believe this is a two-seater. Um, and this is, I think, a cautionary tale when you think about all the new electric vehicles being offered, for example. It doesn't mean they won't prosper, they won't succeed, but it means that you have to really focus on the performance and cost of the car. So the real challenges. Uh, the battery pack is a really expensive. Um, ten twelve thousand dollars in some cases of course if if you're buying a, an eighty thousand dollar sports car that's not as big a deal um but people say oh it's not expensive yes it is expensive and it remains expensive the performance of these vehicles is much worse than um an internal combustion engine the best are listed at a range of 200 miles and what you find usually is that you need to discount that that's under ideal conditions and unlike internal combustion engines or gasoline cars they, they really uh, suffer a lot of performance problems so when they say 200 miles it means on a good day 140 150 uh, you don't want to charge it all the way up um, the recharge can take hours <clears throat> you can uh, get a 20 minute or 30 minute partial recharge if you have a supercharger uh, or some specialized equipment costing again significant amounts of money um, and none of these new cars that come out have really addressed these problems uh, they talk a lot about uh, improving the range and bringing the cost down but the reality is that you're still paying ten to fifteen thousand dollars extra for the vehicle to be electric instead of gasoline efficiency is a very real thing and it is something that we've seen a lot of since oil prices first went up in the 70s uh, and i certainly don't want to downplay it it's a great source of cheap energy supply of a fashion uh, unfortunately people tend to exaggerate the effect or the the uh, future impact um, Amory Lovins, the efficiency expert, uh, famously uh, invented the term megawatts in the late 1980s to argue that uh, what we would be seeing in the future was a peak in uh, a flattening and per perhaps decline in electricity demand in the U.S. Uh, because of so much uh, potential efficiency gains. You can see that the only sector where there's been much impact is industrial, which is arguably uh, partly because of a greater ability to invest in uh, expensive but efficient equipment, saving money on fuel, uh, but also uh, a decline in heavy uh, energy intensive manufacturing in this country. Um, you can certainly see that uh, the internet has not uh, changed the number of uh, the travelers in the US that may happen in the future but you know when you look at uh, people's driving and so forth we're not seeing a big revolution uh, we're not seeing a lot less travel so government support can be very helpful in introducing new technologies but there is a, a sense amongst advocates that you must have government support and that government support can guarantee your success and that is a great exaggeration to start with there are three types of assistance you can get mandates that is people the government saying you must buy a certain amount of renewable electricity if your utility uh, car makers must make cars with a certain efficiency level that's cafe standards the renewable fuel standards is a major reason for the ethanol industry doing as well as it does in the US you can also have subsidies the production tax credit provides uh, about 40 percent of the cost of a solar or wind installation which makes a big difference obviously in the desirability of such and then there's taxes uh, competing fuels or technologies can be taxed either in recognition of externalities or simply because the government wants revenue it doesn't really matter it improves your own competitive position when that is done 
Uh, this shows relative subsidies. Now, people who support renewable energy will tell you that, oh, you know, fossil fuels get a lot of subsidies, and they usually don't quantify that uh, and almost never mention the relative amounts because that would under uh, cut their argument. The reality is this is from the Department of Energy. The data is a couple years old. Uh, and wind, solar, and oil all get about the same government subsidies. However, uh, oil produces, production is far, far greater than wind and solar, which means that uh, solar, for example, gets about seven, uh, sorry, about 100 times as much money per million BTUs as oil does. Wind is a bit better, but still it's about 15 times as much. Um, and you can find that uh, government support is not always reliable. Things do change. Uh, this is a story from Nevada where people went out and bought solar rooftops installations uh, and they thought they would make a certain amount of money from the so electricity that they sold back to the utility. Uh, the government, however, had not guaranteed that and they decided to change that and now people are finding that uh, they're losing money uh, and there's a, a significant political battle going on over this in Nevada. So ultimate lessons, uh, Albert Einstein on the left said, everybody's stupid about something. Now, if Einstein can say that, imagine the rest of us mere mortals. We all make mistakes. Uh, we all fall for irrational exuberance. But I would say that's not much excuse not to try at least to do due diligence, to try to recognize your own biases, to look at the real numbers and data. Uh, and our gentleman on the right, uh, not quite as smart perhaps, uh, and, but probably not mythical. King Solomon supposedly wrote Ecclesiastes, there is nothing new under the sun. And, and that just tells you that uh, you need to know your history. As, as my other lecture, Deja Vu, all over again, points out, people are repeating some of the exact same mistakes that were made in the 70s because they're ignorant of what happened back then. Final lesson, think. Oh, right, sorry.